This week, I'd like to welcome blogger and YouTuber Courtney, also known as Godless Mum, to the show. Hi, Courtney. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Doing well, thanks. Um, so uh, I saw your Twitter account. You're pretty active on, on Twitter, and I've actually heard a couple of interviews with you on other blo- uh, podcasts, rather. And uh, I'm, I was kind of interested in your story. And also, since you're a Canadian, I thought I'd have you on the show. And uh, thanks so much for graciously accepting. Yeah, no problem. So I, I think that what struck me probably the most uh, at the beginning was uh, that you are a godless mom. Uh, what I heard on the podcast was you uh, your story about how you moved from a very... I guess a very secular um, city. I think it was Vancouver, you said, you moved from? Yeah, yeah, Vancouver. Right. And then from Vancouver, you kind of went off and into a slightly more rural part. I guess not rural, but more less populated part of British Columbia. And uh, things were a little different there, right? Yeah, it actually is quite rural. The uh, town that I live in is a farming community, so... And and that uh, moving out there, was that sort of a, I guess, a catalyst towards beginning blogging? Because you didn't blog about atheism, at least, before the move. Is that correct? Yeah, I didn't. I, I was thinking about it for a long time, but um, I had a full-time job in Vancouver. And where I live here, I've been doing, like, freelance stuff, So because there's not a whole lot of jobs around here. So... Um, I had a little bit more time and I'm at home. So that's why pretty much why I started when I moved. So you began your your work, uh, I guess, as a blogger. I mean, was this in re- direct reaction to the new community that you were coming into? No, not necessarily. I, I know that in Vancouver with my friends and stuff like that, the people that I knew, I felt... It was just a feeling I had, you know, I just felt like they didn't care. They didn't care that I wasn't religious or I didn't believe in God or anything like that. Here, I kind of, although I've never had a run-in with anyone, so it might be a little bit unfair for me to say this, but I just feel differently. It just feels very different. Um, You know, it's brought up a lot more, not in a pushy way or anything like that or a judgmental way, but in a you know, just in passing, you know, they'll, they'll call my kids little angels or they'll say stuff like, well, we're, we need prayers for this. We need prayers for that. You know, like they just seem a lot more religious. It, it's, it's more religion than I've ever dealt with before in my life. Have you ever gotten the, uh, which church do you go to or a question? Not yet. No. Okay. So it's not quite, we're not quite at the same level as let's say the South. Well, we also, like, all the school events, because my, my son goes to a private school, and it's it's pretty much a converted house. Like, a big, it was a big house, but it's a converted house. So they don't have a whole lot of room to do anything um, as far as big events go. So all their big events are held in different churches. So I, I think I've been in every church in the town, and there's a lot of them and then of course you know his karate's held in a church and you know everything is in a church here and i've been to more churches since i lived here than i have in the entire rest of my life so but that's probably just a function of there being not a lot of um i guess community centers or something like that so the church kind of substitutes for that yeah yeah and i think like i get the feeling that um although the people that i know are they don't talk about religion all that much um and they they generally center around my son's school and it being a private montessori school you know those those types of parents tend to be different thinkers so a lot of the people i'm around they don't talk about religious religion a lot but um the town does seem to revolve around you know the the churches as as the community centers and stuff like that so Oh, so you're sort of like in a uh, an enclave inside a inside an enclave. Yeah. <laughs> Just to sort of 
circle around, you're currently blogging at uh, godlessmom.com, correct? Uh, do, do you, is this one of the common topics in your blog, uh, talking about how your, your neighborhood is related to the old neighborhood or, or how, how you adapted to it? Or, or is that, or is your blog more sort of a outlet or a way to be openly secular, but not to your immediate surroundings? Um, well, I mean, I, on my Facebook page, I, I mean, I, I openly like, a ton of different atheist pages and stuff like that. And I'm sure that all of my friends on Facebook see that. So it's no secret um, anywhere that I am an atheist. I've never actually, like, with, with people in my real life, I don't actually, like, come out and say I'm an atheist. It just, it never comes up. As a Canadian, you probably experience this too. It just never really comes up, right? At least out here in the West. But, um, yeah, the blog is more about, like, my reaction to stuff that I see on the internet. A lot of the times I'll respond to religious bloggers, and those those tend to be, you know, very sarcastic and sometimes name collie, <laughs> um, you know, less than gracious, but... Uh, they are an outlet for me because I have always been like an activist in some way or another for things that I believe in. And, um, I just, I find it very difficult. I was raised by a therapist, so I've, I was taught my whole life to talk everything out, right? Be (laughs) non-confrontational. No, no. He said, you know, speak up for yourself. And, you know, like he taught me to speak up for myself and to talk everything out, right? Like that was the thing with us was we had to talk about every little thing. And so now it's like the way that I function is that I have to get things out. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so he, he basically taught us to get everything out. And so that's how I function now. And nobody wants to hear me yak about it in my real life. So I write about it online. Personally, when I started blogging, because I got kind of all fired up by um, other blogs like uh, Hemant Mehta's blog, the podcasts online like uh, Ask an Atheist, etc. I consumed a lot of that media, but then when I started blogging about here in Canada, I realized that the scene is really a lot different here, like with groups and with activism, all those things. Yeah, I find it to be completely different. I mean, like I said, in growing up in Vancouver, we were, I was actually in a suburb of Vancouver, um, and like growing up there, it, religion just never came up in my life. I didn't even know what being a Christian was or what churches were really for until I was like eight or nine. You know, like people would talk to me about God and I'd look at them like they were diseased. And I had no idea what it was. I I was very weirded out by anybody who talked to me about religious stuff. It was just very strange and very foreign to me. And that was the way it was with most of the people that I knew in my life. I mean, it wasn't, it just wasn't a thing. It was a non-thing in Vancouver. And, I mean, I had friends who were Chinese, who were Indian, who were, you know, from all over the world. And it was so diverse that, like, every single person I knew had a different religion. So, it was just never a thing. And just reading about and and watching, like, I love watching the atheist experience. And listening to some of the stories and talking to some of the people who who read my blog and who I've connected with on Twitter, it's just so different. Like, it's so different. I remember one of the jobs that I had as a marketing director. I was hired by a Mormon guy, and he was very open about the fact that he was a Mormon, and he, you know, talked about Jesus and his Savior and stuff in the interview. And I just straight out said, no, I'm an atheist. I'm... I don't believe in that stuff and and I'm not going to be forced to to have this job. And he's like, oh, I don't care. You know, like that's his reaction. That was his reaction. He didn't care. Nobody cared. And half the people I worked with at that place were religious. Um, But yeah, it seems to be a very different experience for Americans. I don't know if it's like a north-south thing or if it's more of a an urban-rural thing. It's hard to really put my finger on it. 
Yeah. But it seems like, you know, you, you go you go south enough and uh, you, you run into more, I guess, Kim Davises, for instance, uh, that uh, that clerk, I think, um, in Kentucky. Who did. Yeah. Being a parent in this uh, in in this area, I mean, or actually being an atheist parent in general, being a, a secular parent, there are a few things that I run into, um, and most of them aren't related to the um, community here in Montreal. Uh, Montreal is a very very secular place, so we don't have these problems. Uh, for me, I guess one of the biggest problems being a parent in the atheist community, in the secular community, is the way the atheist community is. Mm -hmm. Um, The demographics, the way they seem to play out. So, for instance, a lot of the meetups are skeptics in the pub. Well, I'm not going to bring my five-year-old to the pub, so I got to find something to do with my kid. Usually, my wife ends up with the kid... But uh, it's very difficult for us to um, coordinate things. Otherwise, uh, babysitters are involved, etc. Yeah, it's the same here. We have here we have um, the Center for Inquiry in because I'm out in the Okanagan, um, in the Okanagan Valley, and I guess in Kelowna they have the Center for Inquiry, which holds um, they're like afternoon get-togethers for kids centered around science so like one of them will be about space another one will be about like biology stuff like that um i haven't actually been to one though i just for me in my real life i don't find it necessary to have to connect with with although i would you know i would love to know for sure that some of the people around me are atheists that would be awesome but like I said, it doesn't. It just doesn't seem to come up with the people that we hang out with. So I think we're a little bit lucky as well because, as as I mentioned, with with my son's school being like a private Montessori school, you're starting off with parents who already think a little bit differently than regular parents. I've never actually come out and asked any of them and said, "Are you an atheist or or are you religious or anything like that?" But they none of them appear to be at all. But like I said, it never really comes up. So you know when we have our outings with them and stuff like that it it'll be like a barbecue centered around like cleaning up the yard of the school and stuff like that or volunteer stuff or fundraisers it's more centered around the kids so it doesn't just doesn't come up but there is a lot of skeptics in the pub and I'm, I'm quite a quite a bit away from from Kelowna and all the skeptics in the pubs are in Kelowna and you know you have a couple of beers you don't want to be driving that far so we haven't gone to one yet, but I would like to for sure. I, it would be neat if I had a, a setup like that. I think that the demographic really is changing. Like you have more young parents. You don't have so many, you know, older men and uh, younger, younger people, kidless people than mm-hmm. you do in the past. So I, I'd like to switch gears here because uh, when I was doing some research on you, I, I read a uh, uh, recent post on your blog and it was called six signs you're an irrational atheist and i noticed the post got a fair number of uh comments some of them were a little heated um yeah. i i guess i guess what was what was the purpose of that blog just for our readers well i had just watched an atheist youtuber who i'm not going to name but who is quite notorious for posting scathing and unending rants that are nothing more than personal attacks at other people. They're not facts. They're not arguments. They're just personal attacks, like calling names, attacking appearance, stuff like that. And I see a lot of that. Like, like for instance, um, you know, when people debate certain topics that have nothing to do with atheism, really, you know, whether you come out on this side or on that side of the topic, people will still find a way to just be angry at you, you know? They they can't just be reasonable about it. They can't just say, you know, I disagree with you and here's why. It's just rude comments and calling names and I just, for me, that sets us back, you know? Like, I don't have a problem with 
if somebody like Kim Davis, you know, for instance, Kim Davis is, is she's disparaging gay people left and right. She's just a, a hideous person. I have no problem calling somebody like that out. But within the atheist community, you know, like we're trying to make it so that places like Bangladesh, you know, it's not so shocking to hear that somebody's an atheist and hopefully one day they won't get murdered. Um, you know, we're trying to, to further this conversation and by calling each other names and just tearing each other apart for little more than having a differing opinion is just, it's, it's backwards. That's all it is. Yeah. I mean, the way I interpreted it, I, I read it again, um, these points and, and it seemed to me that, um, for instance, my blog can become—I I can be very satirical. I, I can poke fun at uh, religious uh, religious folks. I guess I, I try to not sound like a raving lunatic while I'm doing it. And <laughs> uh, also, so far at least, I've steered clear of um, some of the. Uh, I guess the word is deep rifts. I, I don't quite understand it fully, but there are different factions within the atheist movement, if you'd yeah. like to call it that, who attach more uh, social justice issues to uh, the word or, or what you want to call the uh, just the uh, emblem or the uh, of atheism. Than, than purely atheism. And that yeah, that can yeah. really confuse things, I think. Well, I don't have a problem talking about other topics. Like, I mean, I've had plenty of, of posts on my blog about um, the justice system in the States. And, I mean, that's a passion of mine. But I don't have a problem getting heavily involved even in other topics. It's just, it's when people disagree and they think that that's enough to just tear somebody down. Like, for, for instance, like, when I come across a religious person and we just disagree, but that person is capable of having a conversation with me and not calling me names, then why would I do that, you know? And that, and the only time I usually, like, I'm very satirical on my blog, too. I, I call people names and stuff like that. But it's usually people who are you know, trying to hurt other people and they fucking deserve it. If you'll pardon my French, <laughs> he, they, you know, like Kim Davis, for instance, or Ben Carson, or, you know, like these uber religious people that are trying to take rights away from other people and hurt people. You know, I don't have a problem calling them names, but when it's somebody like a reasonable person who you just disagree with, I, I saw so many videos by, this one in particular YouTuber who who responds to other atheists that are, it's just scathing. Like, and these atheists have done nothing but express their opinion. They've called nobody names. They've you know they just have a differing opinion, and it's just like I said. I think it's it sets us backwards, and we need to prove that. You know, there is a way to discuss heated topics while being rational and while respecting each other. And I think that some people are just, they don't understand that. You know, today I just read in Twitter that um, uh, Bernie Sanders, and I admit that I do follow um, U.S. politics pretty closely. So Bernie Sanders actually did a speech at Liberty, I think it was Liberty University, the big, big uh, fundamentalist Christian college or university. And at the first of his speech, he said, you know, it's pretty obvious, I'll be frank, that we both, we all, you know, I disagree with probably all of you when it comes to topics like abortion or same-sex marriage. But at the same time, there's plenty of things we do agree with. And it makes sense to work together. And I think that in the atheist community, all too often people concentrate on the differences between of, of points of view rather than focusing on the similarities, especially if, if you're going to be putting this under the aegis of atheism. I mean, 
I mean, shouldn't that be sort of the primary topics? You, you can still you can still disagree with the person uh, person's point of view on hot topics like feminism, for instance, which seems to be a giant thing. Yeah, I try to steer clear of those ones because those those are some of the topics that are like the social justice topics and stuff like that. Those are the topics that tend to elicit this this foam foaming mouth response from people and whether they're they're atheists or not. And I just I personally don't understand why we can't just have a a conversation about it. You know, like why does it have to be so such a threat to everybody for a long time like i've been talking to theists on twitter and you know for the most part they come at me and they're fairly rude and they're fairly you know they they assume a lot of things about me without knowing anything about me which i'm sure is the case for most atheists online and sometimes i get my back up and i will respond not so nicely (laughs) but Sometimes I, you know, I'm in a particularly patient mood and I can just talk to them and just, you know, try to make them see a little bit of reason, at least about me anyway. And I've made a lot of, you know, theist friends that way online. The thing about that is that they're now tuned into what I'm saying. Like, I've been able to break down that wall and they're now listening to me. They may not, they still may not agree with me or they may not be having the doubts that I hope that one day they might but at least they're willing to listen to me now I'm actually I just sent off a blog post a guest blog post to a theist blogger who's going to be posting it I think on Wednesday and I have one coming from him that I'm going to be posting on Wednesday so he sent me one that's that's about um, five things that he wishes atheists could understand about Christians and I sent him one that's the opposite of that. So, you know, these are the, these are accomplishments. These are steps forward because the more we get people, I don't care if people are religious. All I care about is whether or not they're discriminating other people because of their religion. And the only way that we can stop that is by letting them understand us and having a decent civil conversation. And I think that, you know, that's what we should be aimed at. I I totally agree. I had a conversation with a uh, uh, Southern Baptist in in Alabama, and it was similar. It was cordial, and uh, you, I mean you, it is challenging because once you have once you speak to a Christian like this was a Southern Baptist, as I say, you, you know he's not a moron, right? It just forces you to, into a place and I'm not sure that everyone likes to go to that place where they where they feel challenged or where they realize well wait a minute this Christian that I'm speaking with right now he's actually maybe not as dense as I thought they were you know what I mean I think it's a little bit uncomfortable for for some but I mean I've always had friends of all kinds of different religions and stuff like that and like I said we've never really talked about it in in Van- growing up in Vancouver, we never really talked about it much, um, but I didn't see a reason why I couldn't get along with them, and I still don't. And I mean, as long as we just keep seeing everybody as us versus them, I don't think things are ever going to get better. I think that in order for you know atheism to become normal and something that doesn't have a shock value in some parts of the world, then we need to start to get to know other people and be completely open about who we are. Speaking of uh, shock value in other parts of the world, uh, also doing my research, I found that uh, you were helping out on your blog, uh, an atheist in Nigeria Mm -hmm. who ran into quite a bit of problems. I I I guess was this last year or still this year? No, that was in spring of last year. And then I think it was in the fall, it might have been the fall, that um, we were trying to raise funds for him to, to get out here to North America. What was his name again? Was it... Uh, Mubarak. Mubarak. And, and yeah. he, I think I covered him on the blog. He was forced into a, a mental hospital, correct? Yeah, he... Let's see, he texted me from, 
me and, and several other people. He texted us from, or, or private messaged us on Twitter from his mom's cell phone, which she had snuck him. And I'd only talked to him once or twice before. And so I didn't really know whether or not to trust this. So I contacted some of the other people that he had emailed as well. And um, we talked about whether what we should do about it and whether or not this was real. You know, being from Nigeria, it seemed sus- suspect. And um, through my conversations with some of them, I actually talked almost the whole night. I talked to Paul from Quranify Me. He told me that he had known Mubarak for a while and had been talking to Mubarak for a while and trying to tell Mubarak not to tell his family that he was an atheist. Wow. I and did. Mubarak did it anyway. So, um, <laughs> so it turned out that it was true. We ended up um, launching a campaign on Twitter, and through that, we caught the attention of um, the International Humanists and Ethical Union. And um, Bob Churchill from IHU was our contact, and he had he knew people on the ground in Nigeria who confirmed it for us. So we knew we were good to go, and we just launched this huge campaign. I had been collecting email addresses all the way up until the point of launch, and I had a couple hundred of them. So I sent out emails to them with uh, a link to a Google Doc with all kinds of tweets and stuff that they could do and emails that they could send to high-profile atheists like Richard Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss and stuff like that. And uh, they did. They all did. They were just amazing. And within an hour, because I had posted the story on my website, within an hour my website had crashed because Richard Dawkins had retweeted it and Lawrence Krauss had posted it on his Facebook. And so, yeah, and then it got even more attention from there. It was on the BBC... Uh, one of the people working on the campaign with me, one of the um, IHU representatives in Nigeria, Nigeria, Bami was um, he was interviewed by the BBC, and it was on Vice and um, all the major American newspapers and stuff like that. So eventually, the hospital that he was in went on strike. And he was uh, released because of the strike, but his his father was um, basically he decided not to take him to a different mental institution because of the uproar, because of the the worldwide coverage of this. So I guess that could be good, but you know you never know what happens when the uproar tones down. Yeah, well, I've been in contact with with uh, Mubarak since then, and he fled because he lived in the north of um, Nigeria, which is predominantly under Sharia law um, and you know ruled by Boko Haram and the like. And uh, so he fled the north of Nigeria, and he's now in the south, which is uh, very Christian. So. Um, you know, it's still very uh, not welcoming for atheists, but it's safer. Basically, what we're talking about, it's not chop your head off or blow you up racism. It's more like, or not racism, but uh, prejudice. Um, it's it's more like uh, you're not going to get a job sort of situation, right? Yeah, and it's also because it's, you know, it's not that far away from... The North, he still runs the risk of... Someone could you know, swing the, down there. Exactly. Yeah. So he does have to kind of keep his whereabouts under wraps. But he just emailed me actually about two weeks ago saying that he just got a job. So, um, And he's a like he's an extremely intelligent man. He's got a uh, chemical engineering degree. He was accepted into a... A school in Massachusetts and that's what we were trying to raise money for but we failed <laughs> and he had to stay in Nigeria and we all felt really awful about that. How much was the shortfall? Uh, about 50 grand. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Well the thing is is he I mean he had to make tuition 
and flights. And, you know, we were hoping that he would meet somebody kind enough to put him up. You know, like, it, it's not cheap to fly to the U.S., to Boston, and, you know, pay for a fur furthering your chemical engineering degree. <laughs> you know, that's not a cheap thing. So we knew yeah. we were asking for a lot, but we had to try for him anyway because it felt like we had helped him get out of the hospital, but then we just felt helpless, you know, like he's still to this day in danger. If I told anybody where exactly he was, he'd be in danger. And it's just, it's no way that anybody should be living. Perhaps what what you can do or what, what he can do in the future after he's been working for a while and he's got even a little bit of money is to try to get um, some sort of uh, position at another another school or maybe get invited to a conference or something like that in another country. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure if he managed to land himself on EU soil, or Canadian soil, or U.S. soil, or one of those places, and he were to, uh, you know, uh, request amnesty or, or declare himself a, a refugee, uh, based off the um, BBC coverage, I think that he'd have a pretty compelling case for being oh, for accepted sure. for asylum. For sure. I actually, when we were trying to raise funds, I actually contacted a few airlines. Um, I tried to get in touch with Richard Branson because I figured he'd be the the one who who would be most likely to sympathize and um, just to just to get his airfare covered. But I didn't get any response. Um, but yeah, I think that if he ended up here in North America or in Europe somewhere. He would definitely have a chance to claim an amnesty and stay, but yeah, he's he's basically he's been couch hopping for the last year and relying on the kindness of other people, and um, so you know I think he's fairly behind right now. Like he doesn't have any money, and he's basically starting from scratch. So um, I'm hoping that one day he'll have enough money to come out here because. I mean, just imagine what his reaction would be to to how secular things are in Canada, you know, like compared to Nigeria. It is kind of a shame, too. I mean, I don't know what the situation is with his family life. You think that maybe he might have an uncle or 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 his his parents. If I had a kid who I know is in dire, dire danger where I where he is now regardless whether I agree with him or disagree with him I would probably give him money so he could go and be safe yeah you know? yeah the the only thing is is that um from what we understood his father had ties to Boko Haram Whoa. so you know we're we're talking about people who who slaughter people regularly and I mean, I think that anybody who goes near Mubarak is in danger. I mean, if I showed up in Nigeria, I'm sure I would be in danger. Um, and so all the people who are in Nigeria, his lawyer, um, his that's part of the... We actually had um, a pretty big uh, debate with some people about whether or not this was true. And we couldn't tell anybody how we knew it was true because we would be endangering people. Like, we, we couldn't say, well, we know because this person on the ground confirmed. You know, if we named anybody and gave them their contact information, that person would, would have been instantly in danger. And so we had to just let it go. We had to, and there were some pretty prominent atheists that we were debating about with it, uh, over that. And, you know, we had to just let it go. We had to just say, look, we don't, we, whatever, we'll have to just not have your support then. <laughs> Because we can't release this information and endanger somebody else. We had support from, like I said, people like Richard Dawkins and and Lawrence Krauss and stuff like that. So I think that 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 did enough. And obviously we got him out of the hospital, but there was just still some prominent atheists out there who just they couldn't give us a retweet because we couldn't prove it to them. And I I mean I I understand being skeptical. I get it. You know, like. 
I'm, I've never been religious, but I imagine if I had been and I deconverted, I would feel a little bit lied to and duped and I would try to avoid ever getting duped again, you know? That'd be a sore spot, I think, for me. So I, I get it, but it was a little frustrating at the time, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, I, I'm actually quite amazed uh, when you said that he, we had, there were people trying to dissuade him to come out and he came out anyway. Especially in that situation, surely he was intelligent enough to know that the risks involve. But that's something I've been seeing over and over lately, especially in places like the Middle East, where secularists and atheists have really been speaking out lately. And they, um, it's just amazing courage. I, I, I like these Bangladeshi uh, bloggers, or, or even there were, recently there was a, a woman who, um, had a picture of uh, a piece of paper that she was holding up in front of the um, uh, at the Hajj there in front of the the large black cube that I always forget the name of it, um, but the <laughs> the big one you know with yeah, the stone in it about. and uh, and she's got this paper and on it it says um, Atheist Republic, yeah, and it's. Wow. I mean, something like that, you know, people might say, wow, that's really stupid. Why, why would anyone do that? But I think what it shows is just a, a really an extreme urge to um, to express yourself at, at any cost. Just yeah. you must feel very trapped to, in your society to, to do that, to feel like you need to do that. On a brighter note... <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, just to sum things up, I just want to, uh, once again, uh, uh, draw some attention to your blog. So your, your blog is godlessmom.com. Mm-hmm. You're also on Twitter, um, at sign godless underscore mom. And, uh, I also saw a couple of, uh, YouTube videos as well that you're doing. Yeah. I've been dabbling in the videos. I, I wish, you know, I wish I had more time. I'm already stretching it to the limit. That's another yes. reason. That's another reason that uh, I'm not uh, involving myself in some of these uh, uh, big debates in the in the atheist community. It's just simply I, someone will send me a comment that's about a thousand words long, and I have no way of responding. Yeah. You have the videos up. Do you, do you have any other projects in, in plan? Like, uh, do you have any other things that you're working on? Um, well, I have been negotiating with um, some people potentially to put out a book. So I'm hoping to be able to do that sometime in the next year because I write enough that I should have a book by now. <laughs> So this wouldn't be just a distillation of the blog. This would be like, uh, I, I guess, a story. Would this be your story or? Um, well, we're s- that's kind of where we're at right now is trying to figure out what the actual topic will be. And I think it's going to be along the lines of growing up without religion because I have never been religious. And I, I mean, I've never really understood belief. And I think that. You know, we have lots of story of deconversion out there, lots of stories of deconversion out there, but um, I think that hearing about how secular families live, you know, from from the beginning, because my whole life has just been religion-free. So I think that's kind of the direction we're going to go in, but I'm not sure yet. We might go with something to do with parenting. I don't know. I, the two could be sort of related, I guess. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, well, because I've done a lot of traveling and like I've led a pretty extraordinary life for someone my age. And I've seen a lot of places and done a lot of things. And there's just so much that I want to convey through like what I learned through all of these things. So... I think it it's going to be tied into like my life somehow and, and like some of the things that I learned in different parts of the world and stuff like that. I think I'm I got the more common story. I have a friend, I have at least a couple of friends. I have one Buddhist friend that's pretty close to atheist uh, her version at least. And I have another friend who grew up uh with uh, parents who were from India but they were both atheists. So she was atheist. And it really is a different vibe completely. 
And mm-hmm. that that particular point of view, the point of view of someone who's never been religious in the atheist community, I, I get the feeling that uh, sometimes that's kind of mis not misrepresented, but just underrepresented. Yeah, well, I think that like like for me in particular. I can't really speak for other people who grew up without religion, but for me in particular, like, I find the constant conversation about the Bible really tedious because I just hold there, it holds no weight. For me, it's just another book on the shelf, right? Like, I've never had people quote it to me in seriousness outside of, you know, the stuff that I do online as an atheist now. I, it's the first time I've ever had people like, oh no, the Bible says this and the Bible says that. Well, I don't really care what the Bible says. <laughs> and, you know, I find that a lot of atheists, like like Matt Dillahunty, for instance, he's fantastic at debating the Bible. I could never do that because I just, like, I didn't grow up with it. I don't know it that well. I've read it, but it's just, it, for me, it's just mumbo jumbo. <laughs> and I just, you know, like, it's a completely different thing for me than I think it is for some other atheists. I think a lot of people hone in on, you know, the details, the fine details of what the Bible says and stuff like that. And I just, I don't care. Like, I just, I don't believe in any of it. I don't see a point in really discussing it. I guess I'm more of a literary atheist. I didn't read all these science books. I came at it more from a philosophical point of view. Mm -hmm. And so I was reading things like Bertrand Russell, that kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, what I find to be a little tiring after a while is the constant discussion about evolution. Mm-hmm. Evolution is so completely uh, non-controversial to me, and it's also non-controversial to a lot of my Catholic friends, too. Yeah, seriously. So when I hear these shows talking on and on about evolution, as, as if somehow evolution being true or false at all answers the question of God— to me, it doesn't at all. It it has no bearing. Yeah, I, I don't. I can't stand it either. Especially since I'm not a scientist. Like I understand the basic ideas, um, you know, in the theory of evolution and stuff like that. I I get it, and I, you know, I'm a pretty good researcher. I know how to Google stuff, <laughs> and I can figure stuff out if I need to. But for me, it's just it comes down to one thing. I'm an atheist because I've never had a reason not to be. <laughs> I've never had you know, su- sufficient evidence to to say, oh, okay, you know what, God's real then. And even if, like, I had a, I had a friend of mine ask me recently, she said, if you witnessed, you know, a miracle, uh, would you believe? Like, if you saw it personally right before your eyes, would you believe? And I said, no. I said, I'm not a scientist. I can't make a judgment call like that. I can't say, you know, just because I personally can't... D- explain what just happened it doesn't mean that there isn't an explanation that falls within the realm of things we already know and if it falls outside of that realm and it's something that we don't know well that doesn't necessarily mean it's supernatural i really i don't even understand what supernatural means to be honest like for me is if it's real and demonstrable then isn't that just natural i i don't understand but yeah i for me, it's got nothing to do with evolution. It's got nothing to do with science. It's got nothing to do with the Bible or anything like that. For me, it is just, I don't have a reason to believe yet. And maybe one day I will, but it would have to be, you know, pretty decent evidence. And that's about all. A God, I mean, if this is the Christian God, then how are we even supposed to know it's the Christian God when we see it? I mean, yeah. If this is supposed to be the all-powerful thing, I mean, it can't even be defined properly for us. How are we supposed to know if if something if someone comes down and walks on water? I mean, how am I supposed to know that's the son of God or God or just simply someone who's developed some technology to allow them to do this? Right. If I saw something that was that inexplicable to me, which I have seen many things that are inexplicable, like. How arrogant of people to think that we should be able to explain everything we experience. <laughs> like, it, of course we can't. But if I if I did, if I saw like, let's say I saw, you know, the specter of Jesus Christ in front of me, and I was all like, "What the hell is going on?" I, instantly, I would doubt myself. I would doubt my own sanity, and I would, 
you know, if I really needed to figure out what was going on, I would consult, you know, professionals to investigate. And I think that people who just take personal experience as evidence, it's that's no more evidence than hearsay is because you have to rule out all of the possibilities. You can't just automatically say, well, this is what I feel it is. And so that's what it must be. Yeah, that's a form of uh, humility that uh, I find lacking on the other side. And oftentimes, it'll be the same, the very same people who say that we're saying that we're the know-it-alls. And it's, yeah. it's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we're the ones who say we don't know. You know, we're the ones who say there's more to figure out here. And we don't know anything for certain. So I don't, I don't understand that either, that line of questioning. So, Courtney, with that, I think we're probably going to wrap up the show. Before I end, though, I'd just like to give your coordinates again. Um, you are Godless Mom, so Godless underscore Mom on Twitter. And you have the blog GodlessMom.com. And uh, yeah, you're also on YouTube as Godless Blog, sorry, Godless Mom on YouTube. Yeah. Courtney, thanks so much for being on the show, and I hope to have you back again soon. Thank you so much for having me.